Welcome to Hashtag Heal Me Too at Home with a bonus interview to conclude our third season, offering insights, art, and activism to meet the needs of now. I'm Hope Sinkson, the artist, activist, survivor, and founder of the Heal Me Too Festival and Podcast. If you're listening on Apple or any podcast, you might want to check out the YouTube channel for the Heal Me Too Podcast and Festival to watch the video of this interview and 10 more episodes in season three. In the Heal Me Too at Home series, I'm talking to advocates and healing practitioners about the many traumas that survivors and our communities have been experiencing since shutdown, with a special focus on stories you may not be hearing about and ideas, tools, and actions that may help. Subscribe to the Heal Me Too podcast today on YouTube and Apple or anywhere you get podcasts. And follow us at Heal Me Too Fest on social media to hear about every new episode and every live event I hope we'll start offering soon on Zoom. A quick note about today, we won't focus on graphic details, but I do encourage you to take a break or skip ahead anytime you need. And you can find a list of support resources at healmetoopodcast.com. At live Heal Me Too events, we always start with community agreements, and I offer one of them at the top of every episode called Ouch, Oops, O, or the three O's. I learned this tool at Art New York, and I offer it as a white, cis, middle-class queer host working for social justice on America's East Coast as an activist and through the Heal Me Too platform. But I am definitely aware that I make mistakes and missteps. If I say or do something that causes discomfort or harm, I will be grateful if you, viewers and listeners, as well as my guests, will let me know by saying ouch so I can say oops and listen in the spirit of O oh, to learn to do better. While I'm asking for your understanding, I'll also mention my Wi-Fi is imperfect too, so I hope you will hang in there if we have any Zoom glitches. Now... I'm so delighted to welcome Chaney Waits to share her wisdom about resilience, repair, and her powerful work in Rwanda. Chaney is an applied theater practitioner, performing and voiceover artist, educator, facilitator, and program consultant. Chaney has worked and collaborated with youth, senior citizens, and social justice leadership programs in the United States, Rwanda, and South Africa. She has facilitated workshops within schools, hospital care facilities, supportive housing communities, and correction facilities. Cheney has toured and performed professionally within the United States and abroad. Cheney has a master's in applied theater from the School of Professional Studies, City University of New York, and has a BA in theater with minors in anthropology and dance from Penn State University. And I am so delighted to welcome Chaney Waits. Thank you, Hope. Thank you for the invitation to be with you today. Well, I'm so delighted that you are here. Um, I came to know you, as you know, by attending your phenomenal and generous resilience training which was offered by Hollaback in the days after the January 6th white supremacist attack on the Capitol. I thought maybe we could start just by telling listeners uh, a thumbnail of what that training was intended to do. Hollaback is a nonprofit organization whose commitment is to uh, ending harassment in all of its forms. And this, it was one of the public trainings that are offered for free throughout the calendar year. But due to the events of January 6th, this public training on resilience took a different tone, specifically to process, to, for it to be a space for people to process their responses, experiences of the January 6th uh, attempted coup. We typically don't have such a specific traumatic event or event focus for the resilience trainings. 
in my experience, I should say, Hollaback began this training as part of the response to the global pandemic. Mm -hmm. So the training itself, um, as far as I know, only surfaced within the calendar year of 2020. Mm -hmm. And Hollaback wanted to offer up, this was their response, one of their responses, a place for processing. And that was something that we had, I had to uh, gain clarity on. If that's what we're going to do, then um, let's do it. Mm -hmm. And you did it so as well as we can. Oh, you did it really, really well. <laughs> You don't mind my showering you with, you know, praise. It really, I wanted to share what my experience was. I don't think I've actually told you this, but my experience sort of through the, was it an hour, hour and a half? It was like a little over an hour. A little over an hour uh, because the usual structure is 60 minutes head to toe, but we allowed, um, uh, though I was initially thinking it needs to be two hours or 90, like it was given flexibility to honor what feels right and lit and lent myself towards let's keep it in its fullness with resolve one hour, however, linger for more Q and a question and answering. So yeah. it did end up being more than a, more than 60 minutes in totality though we put a period on it at 60 minutes. Right. Or I should say a semicolon <laughs> for those who <laughs> wanted to leave, who were, who were, who had their fill. Who had, yeah. Yeah. Um, through that, like, I think I was there for 75 minutes. You uh, and the, and the training pedagogy helped me remember my body, helped me locate what I was feeling and connect it with my body helped me explore the things that eventually in the curriculum helped me explore things that bring gratitude that I feel gratitude about, which for me opened my heart even more. Like one of the things I was experiencing coming into the, one of the reasons I needed so badly to be there and got so much from it is that I was really having a hard time feeling. It was so, I mean, it wasn't just the six, it was the entire last year, the entire four years, you know, and I was really, especially that um, immediate crisis of, of what we witnessed and what we continued to learn over those immediate next few days about what happened on the six. I was just having trouble feeling my, my deep, you know, grief, anger, fear, like all of the feels and which isn't, doesn't feel like the right word for something as horrible as that. But anyway, um, so, so opening my heart through that gratitude practice actually allowed me to settle into the feelings, to have the grief of it come up more. And that was so helpful. Um, and then you, if I remember, there was something that was also helping lead me towards joy, personal sources of joy. And it might be especially that you were talking about that as a critical aspect of resilience, which we can get to in a second. But by the end, uh, you had helped me discover that I could breathe again mm -hmm. and return from the trauma response of crisis, you know, and being so, so tightly held, um, holding myself together, I guess, and responding to every little thing in the news, but um, to feel that I could be here and be more okay or like there was a container of knowing I was okay. The, the resilience training itself was a container where I was okay. And in your company, you know, and in your guidance felt more safe. Um, and even though the events around and, and contained within brought so much pain and uncertainty and fear it, that I could afford to breathe. Um, so I was much more restored to myself thanks to this training <laughs> and uh, just to express my gratitude again. Thank you for sharing. And I'm glad to hear that. Those are all the, the nuggets, the, the, the segments you highlighted are anchors for the resilience training. And one of the variations that you experienced though was 
deepening of being in those spaces of, well, body attention, mm-hmm. of lingering there in such a way where you have consciously asked to know. I was guiding the group in how to, not how to, giving oneself permission to recognize and acknowledge. Trauma involves being stuck and uh, restricted. Our breath helps us find the flow again. Does not eliminate, but it helps open. Open to see, literally and metaphorically, to feel, to acknowledge. And acknowledgement is an essential part of healing and reconciliation. And this particular event serving as the uh, well, the event, I'll say, the stimulus has a history that many people will bring be bringing different experiences of histories to this moment and all the processing that is connected to it. So there, I put in a lot of thought about how to manage that with the responsibility that I feel for masses of people within this screen scenario Mm -hmm. that is not my go-to form connecting while also seeing about me. How am I? What do I need to have in place? So all of those considerations were ongoing in addition to being a part of preparing to show up and, and hold space for that. Yeah. And we as human beings navigating this human condition, a part of our capacity for resilience is in being able to rebound and that recovery involves the joy and the grief, not either or, or depending on one's The value and theoretical system, if you want to call it the, the yin and the yang, or forgive me if I'm pronouncing it wrong, the, the ends, dark and light, whatever cosmology one is working from, we hold them both, the good and the bad. Yeah. How can we exist with them and, not, and uh, reduce the amount of stuckness that does not then allow us to continue living and breathing? not agreeing with, but how to continue to be evolving. And, and, And breath is what is the key marker for human life, animal life. When we cease breathing, this skin, these bodies we're in can no longer support our spirits. And that's when the death occurs. We experience events that someone who has, me, dealt with a lot of grief, particularly from a young, as a young person. I've been working on ways to figure out how to still keep my light, my cup half full when a lot of what life has dealt on a personal and a structural and macro level and community level, enough ouches that it can be hard. Mm -hmm. So I, this has been a very familiar processing and bringing what I've discovered and am discovering to 
that training was what um, I had to lean into. Yeah. That and that questioning of um, this thing called grief and mourning. I now have words for the differentiation of that. And this, this training came at a moment, I think, of the grief period versus the mourning. Will so, you share? Yet I grief is that immediate, that immediate ache and pain of the loss, of the harm, mm -hmm. that immediate ouch, but it lingers. That's when we've allowed a period for that acknowledgement, for that deep inhale, for those wails, for that immediate response, response versus responsiveness to come forward. That's a part of the grief period. That first shock of the death or of the pain, but that's left a mark on us, whether generationally and in our body, we touch on epigenetics as in culturally to then those marks then are part of the mourning process. We're not really, we're, we're talking about grief. I'm now getting into the world of, of talking about like grief and mourning though it's connected. And that's actually my point of entry of healing because Absolutely. it is the, the mourning is the continued recognition and that imprint that's been left with you. Mourning deals with the imprint and it starts to look different at different stages. Mm -hmm. Having had a parent transition or die as a young person, I did not allow myself to grieve for a few years. And I mean by grieve, let myself cry because right. I was worried about all, some like larger issue, not larger. I was trying to be strong, not become a bother, not cause any worry and deal with some immediate needs like, oh my gosh, what's going to happen next? Where am I going to live? Who am I going to live with if someone else dies? What are we going to, those to do's. Mm -hmm. And also said, I need to not let anyone cry, see me cry. I never mourned for my father. This is my, my beloved father who passed when I was 13. I did not give myself permission to cry at his service. Mm. Not until some years later when I was in high school and what was the spark was the passing of a parent of a dear friend of mine. And I thought, did I, have I forgotten him? And that fear of forgetting because I had closed it off as a protective measure. Mm -hmm. I, it then allowed me to open the feeling and actually begin the mourning process, actually begin my grieving that right. now has gotten me into mourning. And it just starts to look different. And also in that mourning, that imprinting is reconnection. I feel very much connected to my father for me and, and what my uh, faith blanket that I live in has me do. What a and it lovely looks different. way to put it. And I'm still connected. And I still feel a degree of the pain but not as sharply, it's just different. The best way I can say it's different and mourning yeah. makes it different. It starts to be re reorganized or packaged differently. Yeah. So similarly in it, when dealing with a traumatic event or events, mm -hmm. if we don't give ourselves the permission to feel that grief, that pain, that immediate response, you get stuck, you bury it away until it comes and bites you in the behind <laughs> at moments when you may not, you won't expect it and you don't know what that was, but then the accumulation of that. And for some people that bite, that January 6th event was the bite for some people right. who had filed it away and locked it up. All the things that had preceded it, 
all of the 400 years plus of a white supremacist global society that led to the structural happenings, societal beings, and individual relating that led to this moment of observing the, the illness. That's not, wasn't brand new, but for some, it was. Or a wake up call or a clarion, a, a clarifying mm -hmm. moment. Yeah, I'm sure. And then for some of us, a reminder of this morning we've been in. And when I say morning, I also, I do mean the M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G. But I'm going to borrow from also Reverend Barber, who is one of the leader, part of leadership for the Poor People's Campaign, uh, a fight for a moral revival that stemmed from Dr. Martin Luther King's Poor People's Campaign initiated in mm -hmm. 1968, and of whom I, I'm a participant, a part of, an organizer with and for, he said also the morning, M-O-R-N-I-N-G. Right. The morning that comes that, we were talking about transformation and some of our, uh, our getting to know each other exchanges mm -hmm. that you and I have had. Mm -hmm. It's both of those, because we've got to let that, that pain, that ache, that hurt and joy morph and shift into something else. And that is a part of the mourning process as well. Yeah. Wow, thank you for, thank you for sharing your personal story. Thank you for sharing how it connects to this bigger picture and then bringing it back to that resilience training and all that informs, you know, I, and, and also letting us know, letting the listeners know about the Poor People's Campaign that Reverend Barber is remounting or continuing forward. Um, yes, along with Reverend Liz Theo Harris and a conglomerate, conglomerate of thousands of poor people fighting for full humanity yeah. across the racial divisions militarism, all of the words. So it is a, mm -hmm. a, a movement that has never really ended. Mm -hmm. And based in terms of the fundamentals of work, January 6th brought up what, how far have we really come? Are we really willing to step into a third reconstruction? Our first, we've had two in this country, reconstruction mm -hmm. post-Civil War. And then you consider the 1960 civil rights movement, the second. And we, what are we reconstructing? We are reconstructing a society established on the selling of human chattel. That first though stemmed from the genocide of First Nations people. Although stemming from beliefs and practices of racism, racial prejudice plus power, and all then all the ways it manifests. Mm -hmm. So that sixth, I would say, uh, you might have your inciting incident. We can talk some like drama, Jerry, theater, theater lingo, if we will, right? But you have yes, the exposition, exposition and backstory. There's a whole lot of exposition and backstory to that inciting incident of January 6th. Mm -hmm. I almost feel like this is a play where we thought the inciting incident was the sixth, and then we learned that the first you know, it's, middle passage and taking people from Africa is, or, or no, as you said, the genocide of First Columbo. Nation people. Yeah. It was Going really to the East Indies and in the I wrong even wonder, way. I even wonder about the roots, like, anyway, this is a yes. big history so exploration. When we deny learning or deny our stories, our acknowledgement, you have not allowed for grief to really catch in, to it begin. And then it's like, yo, once the story came out, boom, that's the grief, that's the ache, that's the response that you've got to let move through your body, shake it out. And that was some of, these are some of the nuggets I was pulling from of how you have to begin, begin or be in the process of healing. And it is a process. It's not a product oriented linear happening. It is actually spiraling. Mm -hmm. We may circle back to moments, but we're at different points in that spiral, trying to be conscious of the screens. Don't do yes. this, Janie. Be here. Because <laughs> <laughs> we could still be here, though, but I'm getting to it at a different level. 
a different degree, a different depth, with different uh, knowledge base, sensory yeah. base, experience base to come back to that same point, though. Right. New perspective on that same point. So let us say yes to, though, knowing where we are. And that was one of the driving points of that training, too, of, of saying yes to being in the moment to repair and see internally, literally, and feel. Yeah. So that then once we recognize and know, then you can take action to set up boundaries, action plans. And the process of reconciliation, you've got to first tell the story before then and acknowledge the acknowledge the events before an apology can really come and then so that then the repairable actions take place but if you don't ever acknowledge it it's going to stay tight and held though it seeps out like an ooze in our ways of being the ways we relate to people consciously and, and subconsciously why is it that I'm so defensive if that's what it, my th- the, the manifestation is? Why is it that I doubt if that's what the manifestation is? Why is it that I, what are the ways I limit being in my fullness that show up in how I interact with people, how I speak about myself and the language that I use, like all the things mm-hmm. that help construct our identities mm-hmm. and then or construct them to- in limited ways or that, yes. Contribute to unconscious bias, obviously, to mm-hmm. all the, you know, little gestures of privilege and, and as a white person, I'm speaking, you know, little, little unconscious positions that I may take respect, in respect of my power, you know, not even acknowledging that I'm carrying that. Mm-hmm. And, and I, when I say power, I mean perceived, what I believe to be, not yeah. uh, no more power than every other creature on earth. <laughs> but. And we have, though, a system that has allowed for um, allocated misperception power. and, though, actualized power. Yes. That is the yes. truth of our system yes. of racism. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, um, I knew we would jump off and just dive into all of it, you know, as, as you have, as you've, as you've just connected so generously, um, you know, our history, the immediate moment, the work on resilience, the work on grieving, mourning, grief, you know, I really appreciate that distinction and um, I guess I'm going to jump to the idea that you shared about mourning that process being in that being of mourning that that journeying of mourning is part of what restores a feeling of connection to what has in some sense been lost is what I heard and I'm related to a lot in terms of something you actually helped me understand after the resilience training um, around telling our stories. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna say this, this thought and then come back to what it was that you told me or what I remember from what you told me. I'd love for you to remind me because I may not even remember it that well. well I'll try and but, dust it off myself. Yeah, but what I, what I feel in listening to you and knowing my own experience is that when I, when I acknowledge what is, when I am in my feelings, when I am telling the story of whatever occurred, you know, whether that's a survivor story or a cultural trauma story, like the, I, we are in a moment where I think many of us need to process the tra- multiple traumas of this past year, not over yet, you know. Um, so when I'm telling the story of the ouch, um, by releasing the stuckness, moving, moving past the stuckness, I actually am connecting to myself in a different way. And I am able to re-understand, reframe, you know, shift my perspective on what that trauma was. 
I have a feeling that that may be sometimes part of what restores connection where it's been broken. You know, there's an imaginative creative part of, of, of mourning, of grieving, of being in connection with the harm that allows me to shift how I'm living it and reclaim parts of what maybe I felt blocked from or seeing the fuller picture, you know, and sometimes it might even be imaginative, like the person who did me harm, forgiveness, the forgiveness process, perhaps, like seeing the fuller humanity that may have been involved with that person's actions that, so I'm just, I'm just riffing right now on the thing that you said that was very um, full for me of like, what is it that allows me to get more connection through that mourning process? Those are some of my thoughts. I'd be curious for what you feel about that. How wonderful that that is the, the meaning you're able to make of it and are making the um, I come back to acknowledgement. We cannot grow if we are unwilling to recognize whatever it may be, the, the, the joy or the ache. There are necessary moments that are protective acts where mm -hmm. or when we need to put it in the parking lot but it still grows and festers in the parking lot. It still gets rusty. It's still, or even growing because it's still with you. And on some level, informing how you operate or don't operate. We need different strategies to help us get to that parking lot. And, oh, I think it was, because like that slide says something about art making as a tool to uh, this is tell what a story. prompted my right? question to and you. you yeah. yeah, and should when we, you look at, I mean, if you just look at the slide, it's like, what, huh? I get should you. we let, should we let the listeners in on what we're talking about? The, the training had a few steps to it. And one of them was creating your story and yes, art was offered two. as a way to create your story. And I, my question in the, Q and A afterwards was like, could you? I'm finding that a little general, even though I'm I'm like a healing through the arts person. But I was like, I'm not sure what you mean about like make art to create your story. Tell me more. And that's where you. Sorry, I interrupted you. I just wanted to loop listeners in. The, yes, all good. Thank you for that, Hobie. Because the training did have three components of embracing what is, and a number of the the journey of that embracing, which involves the saying yes to the feeling and acknowledging to then step two of this creating your own story, which is where we have the ability to evoke choice and activation. And I, I shared those two quotes in particular at the beginning of the particular of Maya Angelou and of uh, uh, Victor Frankel. I think that's his last name. Yes, I digress. Let me get... So you look at a slide, there are words. What, <laughs> what meaning can we make of those words? Especially if you're, so I love that there was time though to, to, to try and let's pull the layers back from that. So what I'm sharing is my understanding of what that means to me. I, I don't know that that was the understanding of the creator of the training skeleton. But that was, that explanation was a piece of the fascia, the flesh, the muscle that I added to it, which is creating your own story also means generating it, sharing it, outputting it. And what are the various ways that you externalize it or connect to the internal to help the release of it? And Art and art with a lowercase a, because I believe we are all artists. 
and art activists and act artivists, whatever all the things people say now. <laughs> but essentially, I am one of my values is that all people are artists, are creators and movers and ability and have the ability to impact humanity. I strive for all my work to be that which is impacting humanity positively. And with the goal, and those are some of the values, which I don't know if I sent, maybe I sent you the wrong bio. I didn't hear that mentioned. And oh. when you read it around my value of working towards undoing racism and that being a guide and that healing component of all the work that I do. Yeah. Um, and I may have left that out. I thought I put it in, it's okay. I, I'm so sorry if I missed it. I think it, but I'm really glad you're adding it now. So because that's one of my values, And that art can be the vehicle for which this can be achieved. It can be one of the methods used in healing practices and healing art. I mean, this, like the word, what am I trying to get to? Cheney words. And I do, so I talk to myself <laughs> in the third person often. I do. And I'm, and I, uh, that's a part of also me talking to me and create and have, having the dialogue with me having the story share with me. I've heard a number of mental health experts on coming on TV throughout this pandemic and when they're speaking of nuggets around self-care, around resilience, around mental health strategies. And I was like, oh my gosh, these people with letters behind their names and who have studied this are saying some of the things that my layperson self has been saying. And one of them was talking about talking to yourself, like the way that you would be talking to a friend, extending those same courtesies to yourself. And that might actually mean literally doing the act of talking to yourself. <laughs> sure. And there is a way to Make do it that real. and it's healthy and it's not connected to- uh, Mental illness. An no. illness. No. So it's a part of self-talk, self-love. Mm -hmm. Or like, so <laughs> that's a that is a form of story making, of activation. How do we activate the vehicles that allow us to process, that allow us to claim our experience and not deny it? Because a part of telling, creating your story is a part of claiming it, of owning it, of owning your experience, not denying it, not letting others deny it but you being seated in what you know, what you've experienced, and also where you're gonna go with it, how you are going to heal from it. That's my under one of my understandings of this bullet point number two in a 60 minute experience of creating story. There's so much there. So that's, and in that creating of story, that's the phrase used, it means speaking it. It means sharing it, acknowledging it. Rwanda, the nations of Rwanda or countries, yes, countries, nations, they're synonymous, and South Africa have engaged in truth and reconciliation events. They have put resources towards that step one in a reconciliatory process, which is telling the story to acknowledge. Yo, there's a lot of work to be done in both nations and others and ours included. But if you, you can't say you're in a healing process or recon want reconciliation if you're not willing to see it, if you're not willing to feel it, if you are gonna just dismiss it. Various reasons for reasons for dismissing. Um, a lot of motivation. So if you really want to be in a therapeutic process, you got to say yes to showing up, to, to, to sharing it, mm -hmm. to speaking it. Because then that's only then when, when you learn better what it is, what the ache is, what the trauma is. So that then once you know, we can then prescribe things to help alleviate 
reduce, maybe even eliminate, depending on what we're talking about. But at least getting us in the car of journeying towards return to wholeness, towards repairing, towards repair. Right. And you have to, that has to be more conscious, the journey, saying yes to being on the journey to repair. So something I did in that training, which was specific to that day, and also which I envelop in some of the other training, specifically the training that when I lead, uh, one that we have on police-sponsored violence and anti-Black sentiment. Because dealing with racism, that is the longest ill of this nation. And collectively have not said yes to telling the story, to the acknowledgement. What are the ways that still demonstrate our inability to acknowledge this huge onion, the uh, mm -hmm. 1776 project that was initiated by the Trump administration to counter the 1619 of wrong histories to then also the, 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 the uh, like on the just day-to-day -day level where it becomes hard to, why can't we just interact and see you as a wonderful human being in your fullness and in all of your difference that makes you uniquely who you are and who y'all are? We are all infected by it. We all are. We all are. Yeah. So I'm looking forward to a time when the, this nation can start its reconciliation process, which begins with the naming. I know. I feel like little germs, little glints, little sparks, you know, positively uh, were brought into being through this summer's uprising. But it's something that I really hope and, you know, am seeking all the ways and, and we all need to be seeking all the ways that we can ensure that it flourishes and that it expands and that it is built up beyond these just these little nascent beginnings of acknowledgement mm -hmm. I feel like we started acknowledging the present you know and through that reckoning conversation you know the media focuses on something for a while and moves on and I wish that we would have I wish that we would have a truth and reconciliation process that we would commit the attention and intestinal fortitude that it would require and mm. I don't know did you say intestinal I, fortitude yeah 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 yes yeah. yes I'm with you yes because this is deep in the bowels and that's where we off that's where we hold the the bowels hold I'm gonna say the everything mm -hmm. this is the, the word underbelly the truth like was really the underneath. secret the Ooh, yeah. yes yeah and it can then yeah. manifest as dis-ease or disease yeah. And so how or can we dare to get in, be in the muck, be in the trenches, right. get into that underbelly? Because then that's the only way to really have moved towards um, enriching wholeness. Resilience, I know you're asking me, is about being yeah, able yeah, to, yeah. Res to rebound, to rebound. That's what it means, to recover, to recover to a moment, to places where you can be your healthiest self. And resilience is an ongoing act. We can, we exemplify resilience in, on personal, interpersonal levels through practices, explorations, ways of being that help us recover, to help us get the fact together when we have been fall, right. when we've been broken or ripped apart. And as well as when there are moments when there hasn't been those aggressive harms that then can pr propel us though to continued evolution, ever evolving. And we have resilience within our communities, within our affinity groups and com different communities. We've learned resilience and what that, and the different ways that it manifests. It manif shows, shows up in our stories, our music, our cultural practices, our ways of relating. Yeah, our ways of relating. That which is passed on through culture, 
Mm-hmm. So, mm. and we practice and we cultivate the strengths of the skills, the wherewithal, yes, the the tolerance, the intestinal fortitude. We get more, we get more and more better. At yes, and we have we to be do doing it. the work simultaneous. On yeah. the end of the, the 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 individual, and I hesitate to say the word individual. Why? Mm-hmm. Because it typically has a connotation that it is well, an eye centeredness in I'm gonna say an Amer- North Am- an American paradigm is different than communities where it's a we. I am. I can only exist because either I can only exist because there's a we, and we carry that more communal sense as well as ancestral sense that's with us at all times. So that's where my, my hiccup is. But to work about where we are because we are a part of a larger whole. So let's think with our individual part has to be massaged, excavated, worked on, jostled, caressed, cared for simultaneously as the whole in order then for systemic work to happen. It is simultaneous. Mm -hmm. So if we can become the better nuggets in this big old vat of nuggetdom, then the bigger (laughs) nugget will, I do believe that the butterfly effect, it will inform, it does, it will impact. And it does that whether it's a negative or a positive uh, degree Mm -hmm. of impact. It does, that, that, that is true. Mm-hmm. So, right. Like the story sort of sharing creating has to happen. Of... No, go ahead. The, the, the creating the story has to happen on all of the levels and be happening simultaneously. Yeah. Yeah. I thought you were going to say simultaneously. Um, well, this is getting at the idea of the grief and the joy. So I thought you were going to say, um, we need to be taking care of ourselves and all the, all the beautiful verbs you used, you know, all the physical verbs of, you know, the caress and the, the care, you know, toward our, the part where we're kind of emerging out of the pain and also the willingness to continue digging into or being open to or opening a channel to, or I'm trying to think of the right metaphor, but you know, um, excavating and expressing and acknowledging like the ill, the ills, you know, of, of our nation, the ills of racism and all the isms aren't going to, you know, it's not, it's going to take more than one additional reconstruction would be my prediction. And, and, I mean, I'm sorry to say, but uh, that that it's this continuation of of that hard work, deep, you know, willingness, and the part of the resilience when we rebound, the part of the resilience where we recover the, you know, and where we have joy. Um, And that the the joy is throughout, I would say, though, it's threaded throughout, though there may be, there is great beauty in death. Mm -hmm. There can be the beauty in that release, if it's for someone for whom the earthly walk was more struggle than joy. I do find beauty and know that experience of having a loved one for whom that release was the joy, honestly. And it's and, it's an and. So there mm-hmm. is, and our acts, our behaviors, our rituals that contribute to resilience need to be threaded out in order to fortify us, soft armor us, to address with the underbelly, to help also then give us the tools to be in that excavation place, some lightness within the gravity. Right. But that tends to exist if we want to get like, to look about like polarities, there is like, what does it mean to get to balance? It means, how do we get to that neutral place? 
where it is a balance and both are equal, it's balanced. We're at pH balance of zero to 14, you wanna be at that seven. Our practices are always in action together to mm -hmm. get to this balance or, mm -hmm. and is it achieved fully in this earthly life? I think for most of us, not, but we're striving towards it in that pendulum. Yeah. It shifts and Maybe sometimes it swung, it swung all over, but we still got a little piece of that zero one pH happening too. What happens to get us closer to the middle? But we still might be here really at the eight end, but we still go, oh, we got some four happening though. <laughs> like we're and it shifts this is like the equalizer of the soul i love it yes yes so <laughs> then what are your scale. rituals and practices then that can help you do that and some of the things we did in the training i'm pulled from things that i've been like guiding myself through or trying to figure out figure out oh this might work for me so maybe it'll work for other people while also oh me in terms of someone who is a practitioner and works and i do love humanity I have times when I really am disappointed and will say, I don't, but I'm trying to always keep my sense of why am I doing what I do and how I do what I do. It is for that commitment of striving towards affirming our highest good, where all human beings are valued and celebrated. That's a driving force of what also determines what I participate in. So what are the, the tools, the things I'm doing to work out my muck? <laughs> and then bringing them forward in pieces as I become more brave to do so. Yeah. Uh, and also feeling, figuring it out on how to do so. And that was one of the gifts of being asked to be able to be a part, do this training in, in the, the chainified way, I should say, within the skeleton. That was a solid one. Do you wanna do the... Uh... A bit of practice we've been talking you've been talking about body stuff and we've been talking about tools and practices yes and and then moving and, and needing to move so we've got to we got to move and shake it out and shaking it out is one of the strategies shared uh in the training so shall we do it together i'm gonna stand up yeah yeah stand yeah me up. too me too gotta get this chair out of the way Let's adjust. Uh, so a balance. Uh, so shaking it out. I have, it has been reinforced through my <laughs> COVID Qigong practice and Qigong being uh, Eastern practice coming from uh, Chinese medicine community of uh -huh. energy work. And I'm giving a very crude basic explanation that is inadequate but something that the practitioner I've been following expressed is how bouncing is one of those equalizing events they said I knew it I enter also life as a dancer and a mover so when we think about when we get very upset about something let's say in a bad way, crying. You may witness this in young people or yourself, if, no matter how tall you are or old you are. The body naturally starts, if we're in a heaving cry, the body is moving with it. That's a part of its own natural knowledge, its own natural majesty of helping get us back to that seven. We do it, we, we do it on our own, uh, sub unconsciously. So we started with just a bounce. And the invitation right now is to stand hip width apart, feet hip width apart, letting your heels slip into the ground if standing is where you are. If you are not standing, the invitation is you can do this seated. You just want to feel, and you can even do this laying down, whatever position you might be showing up to us today. Be connected to the surface you are on, whether it be bed, chair, or floor with feet. And just allow your body to bounce easily. You might start with shaking out 
the limbs or wrists, and then letting that gradually increase in your own time and way so that you are just bouncing. If you're in that big old hoopty car, whatever, and it starts to bounce, just like when you're bouncing a ball, give yourself permission to let your body bounce. And whichever way your spine needs to go, let it go. Uh, there you exhale and make some sound like that. Uh, you're giving yourself, your body permission uh. to bounce, let it go, let it move. <sighs> and you might discover places, oh, where it's stuck, tight, <laughs> constricted, rigid, whatever oh. the words might be, held. And once you start to recognize those held places, maybe you want to give a little more bounce to that. Mm. Me and my, ooh, S4, S5. <sighs> I got to shake it out here to hips. <laughs> Where am so I on my scale? that was a Cheney addition into the bounce to set us up for the shakeout. The shakeout was a staple for Hollowbacks training and also used in some other moments. Uh, the way I guide it is you're going to choose a limb and you're going to count from five to one shaking it. So you'd go five, four, three, two, one. And then you can choose another limb, the other limb, five, four, three, two, one shaking it up, and then shake a leg while you count down from five, four, three, two, one. Then the other leg, five, four, three, two, one. And then I love to add the whole body, five, four, three, two, one. And you can do this in whatever position you're in. Then we repeat again, counting down from four to one. Four, three, two, one. A lot of theater teachers use this all the time. Four, three, two, one, the other limb. Le a leg, four, three, two, one. Other leg, four, three, two, one. Whole body, four, three, two, one. And if it makes you feel like you want to do a little hump shake, do it, whatever it is. Then we do it again. Three, two, one. Three, two, one. Leg, three, two, one. Other leg, three, two, one. Whole body, three, two, one. And we'll see. Hit the closet. It's okay. Hit the wall. Then we do it down for two. Two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one. Whole body, two, one. Then this is really fun. Just one time on each. One, 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 one. As fast as you can, Hope. Yes, again. One, 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 one. <laughs> I uh, muted myself so I wouldn't make it any out. noise with my earring. At the end, that one, 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 I... It was like, what's going, my foot or my hand? That was very fun. And it's okay. It doesn't matter just as long as you're moving. Doesn't matter yeah, which yeah. it is. And I took it to a point where it's not about being right and held. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A tight no, no, form. This is, fun. this is about the release. And sometimes you've Enjoy. got to shake it up. Move it. Break it up. Release it. Let it move. You can't, so I think about giving blood. You've got to prep the arm. I have learned from a master, ooh, I'm forgetting the name of the profession. So people specialize in drawing blood. Yeah, phlebotomy. You've got to prep it in order for it to release. And sometimes that prep is a massage, or a shake. So there's value in our touch practices, our somatic touch practices that are providing sensation to help move energy and awaken it. And the shake out is something that could live, that can live within that category of activated movement for release. Yeah. I also find it especially uh, lit by your joyful spirit. I find it a really great way to kindle joy, pleasure, you know, physical pleasure, spirit, spirit pleasure, just silly pleasure, you know, little 
child pleasure. It was, I just think it's delightful. I think I've mm. used it since that training. Yay. And I love Yeah, we got to yeah. do that. Whatever can give us a giggle. And it is funny. Why is it like when you bounce a child or a big child on your knee, like that just gets you. <laughs> In the same way, like laughing is contagious. Our bodies recognize that as something that's delightful. So let's swim in God, the delight. We need that. Yeah. Um, sure. Man, you have really just opened up so many amazing thoughts, sharings, avenues. I, um, I know we've touched on a lot of what we've intended to, and we have not talked at all about the specific work that you did in Rwanda, I think that, or do continue doing. I think that people can hear um, I'm just looking at the time and realizing we're, we we might need to bring that into a future conversation if we want to. Um, I think people can hear, I know we alluded to the truth and reconciliation process in Rwanda as well as South Africa. And I think probably folks can hear the way that your understandings are informed, I, I imagine, by working with people in places where there is this now this legacy, you know, this positive legacy of that kind of work. Um, and ongoing work. Right, makes sense. I wanted to, uh, before we close, I wanted to share with listeners that one of the reasons I was so eager to have this conversation with you um, as part of the podcast is, is that I'm thinking about focusing our fourth season on themes of resilience and repair with, uh, with an eye to all the myriad things we've been talking about. And in addition, we didn't really touch on COVID per se, but obviously there's, we talked about loss. Um, and, and we talked about uh, the Poor People's Campaign and economic justice and you know the uh, economic crisis of, of the shutdown and of COVID has been uh, disproportionately impacting communities of color. And anyway, my point is there's so much, so much for us right now to move toward and, and embrace as far as the harms we may have the a greater opportunity without Trump in office, a greater opportunity to unpack, you know, the crimes. Maybe we'll be coming a little less fast and furious and we can maybe have a little more opportunity and the hopefully the vaccines and hopefully, you know, recovery and re re reemerging will be in this course of this next year. So I'm thinking about the next season, focusing on resilience and repair work. And so uh, witnessing what you brought to so many of these topics in that training um, made me really excited to get to know you more, hear you more, share what you have to share with listeners more. And, um, and maybe there will be a, we'll, we'll stay in touch and see if there is a time when we want to have a part two. Um, I would, I would love that, obviously. Um, so I don't know, I guess I, I would love to hear if you have any thoughts that you wanted to share before we close on all these things that we have sort of turned up and <clears throat> mm. so many what's in the forefront of the brain here investment investment requires intention and investment is how the intention shows up you invested in speaking to me before this, which allowed us to begin to form a way of relating and connecting for then this small event 
that will hopefully be followed by others. That is a similar, if not the same process that is necessary in healing and restoration. Continued dialogue. Dialogue is also one of the tenets of my practice that was a part of my graduate program using a Freerian based pedagogy and also human centered approach that I encourage people to extend to all of yourself, all of the facets of yourself. So yes, have that dialogue, have that talk to all the pieces of the hope of the Cheney, of the little black girl joy and the girl, all the thing, all the talk to all of you. And some of the ways that our society here often shies away from the talking that we do to our bodies and that talking in the form of healthy touch, energy, even recognition. That's often hard and shrouded in shame, practices of shame or events of trauma. And also an idea that a, the, the brain is not connected to the body, <laughs> that a disconnect of happening or a dissected way of thinking. Resilience involves also how can we reintegrate to be our full, be in our fullness, I believe. How can we increase so that our channels are more connected? And in that connection, it allows us to navigate the pains of life to then say it is well with my soul as the spiritual, to be able to, no matter the seas that toss, can it still be it as well? And that is one of the hallmarks I don't think is truly understood, no matter how you're painted around African-American culture in America that and the role that spiritual life from the, all the cosmologies of the peoples that have created that, our culture, not just of the African diaspora, but also of, our, of all the peoples of the world that flow through my body and my bloodline and in many others and in yours, I'm sure. How are we threading to be more in our fullness, in our greatness? So giving attention to self for that in that larger goal, that macro goal, that super objective, give an actor legal if you need to talk. <laughs> it's cyclical and all and ever go ever growing. So say yes to being in process as best as you can. And there are going to be times when you're like, mm -mm. <laughs> can't, or I don't want to. Or I get a file break. It away, file it away, the why you can't, but stay, stay in the dialogue, stay with it. And I will say, so let me, to, to get us to, yo, we're in a new um, administration. However, what, what's the saying? I don't want to curse, but look. Same underbelly, just a different cover. Don't get it twisted, people, like you can, that we can relax in any way or that there's not gonna be, there's, there's, that the work has finished. It hasn't. Mm -mm. How can we work to, to um, be more honest with the realities and stay the course? To continue to be encouraged, to access your resilience, because that's a part of how to recover. You got to stay in the game. And the, your resilience helps you to recover and stay in the game instead of leave it. So don't check out wholly. The checking out is different than pausing. You might need a pause. You might need a pause to help recover you. Recoup a bit. Yes. And that is a part of the journey as well. Yeah. Sometimes it's saying yeah, that no. not right now, but later, yes. Versus yeah. no, the absolutes. Right. Again, being in the absolutes, the binary, how can we get to the balance? Love it. And I agree. I just want to affirm that I wasn't intending to suggest that. <laughs> I feel that we are just in a different moment where the urgency shifts from crisis response to deep commitment to progress you know, maybe is a way to put it, or, or that's what I'm feeling, you know, like it is no less urgent. If, if anything, in some ways it's more urgent because uh, 
perhaps there's opportunities, you know, to actually achieve something. But, mm-hmm. but time and, and opportunity is so precious and short. But yeah, I'm, I've been taking a bit of a break. <laughs> Good for and, you. And getting, getting back, you know, but actually on that um, note, I should also let listeners know that this is the end of the third season and the podcast will be on a bit of a break um, before we come back with the fourth. And um, I want to thank you, Janie, so much for this conversation and for the beginning of this uh, connection. And I do, I do look forward to future opportunities um, and just want to honor you for spending some of your Saturday with this podcast. Thank you so much, Hope. I have enjoyed being with you and getting and getting to know you. Thank you for the invitation. And I welcome another opportunity as it feels right and good. Mm-hmm. And thank you for actualizing the spark to lead you to holding this space. Thank you. Thanks. Well, that is it for today. And that is it for season three. Um, As I mentioned, we'll be taking a breather before starting season four, focused on resilience and repair. In the meantime, keep in touch on social media. We are at Heal Me Too Fest on all platforms. And if you haven't listened to every episode of seasons one, two, and three, I hope you'll take this time to catch up and here are many more ideas that may help with the needs of right now, whether you're a survivor, an ally, or anyone navigating stress and trauma. I hope you will survive, let's see, the word I'm looking for is subscribe um, to our Heal Me Too podcast and festival YouTube channel, as well as wherever you listen to podcasts. If you take a moment to give us a rating and a review on Apple Podcasts, you can help more survivors and allies to find us. Please join our mailing list at HealMeToPodcast.com so you'll hear about future festival pop-up events on Zoom. And as I said, we are on social media at HealMeToFest. Really love hearing from you in the comments. Thank you for listening.